So finally we are at, we have reached the relativistic <laughs> quantum mechanics. Now let me summarize the basic principles of the quantum mechanics that we have uh, studied till now. That's the so-called non-relativistic quantum mechanics. The basic uh, ingredients, some people call it axioms or postulates, but basic ingredients is that the states are denoted by a Hilbert space vector, which is infinite dimensional, obviously. And these are normalized Well, this normalization condition is a, phys a physical condition, eventually, in order to give the probabilistic interpretation. And the dynamical variables are represented by permission operators. Her well, operators in the first place because the algebra depends on the order and the measurement of the dynamical variables at the physical realm also depends on the order. Thus, we cannot use ordinary C numbers. We have to move to the operators or matrices. Why Hermitian? Hermitian because they are, we know that the eigenvalues of the Hermitian operators are real and there is the correspondence principle, correspondence, meaning that the physical quantities we measure at the laboratory are real quantities and they should now we associate them with the expectation values of the these Hermitian operators which are real. So these things go hand in hand. And the third time evolution because we need dynamics is dictated by this equation. Well here the H is the Hamiltonian operator. So as if we know the uh, value of the psi at a given time, we can predict it at any time, at a later time. And finally, we can use coordinates psi. This is the conventional thing, the psi x of t or phi P of t are the coordinates in the associated bases, which is, in this case, this basis is the position eigenvectors, which are normal, orthonormal and complete, or the momentum eigenvector bases. And obviously these coordinate functions, which are infinite dimensional square integrable functions, they also satisfy an uh, equation which is similar to this abstract equation, which is known as Schrodinger equation. And this normalization condition in terms of these coordinates take the following form. And as these are going to play a rather important role eventually I would like to state it. Notice that this quantity now is the density, probability density. It is, it is positive definite and the sum over all options is equal to 1. Obviously these are the basic axioms of the probability theory and, if we are, and as we have a probabilistic interpretation of the dynamics now, it is consistent with the basic principles of the probability. That is, densities are positive definite, mod square, and the sum, which is an infinite sum now, as these are continuous functions, and they add up to one. Well, this integral tells you the, the sort of the conservation of the probability, implies the conservation of probability. That is, when we take the time derivative of this, it should be equal to zero. Now we are at an important point really because this means that if you normalize the 
state vector or the wave function, whichever language you are using, at a given time it should stay normalized. Otherwise it would mean there is an interference or a leak in or leak out. So it's not the Hamiltonian, which is the central object in this game only, but there are additional things, Hermitian or non-Hermitian interfering, particularly non-Hermitian things are interfering. So in order to eliminate all those things, although they are subject of research in their own right, we have to ensure all the time that the total probability is conserved. And this is guaranteed by the presence of this continuity equation which follows from the equation of motion directly this or the coordinate version of this, as you are quite familiar, you see that it's going to play an important role in the relativization of the quantum theory. Relativization, I say, because what we do is, let me postpone it to a few <laughs> later stage. So this follows from here, it's obvious, if you integrate this, and there is a total divergence, it's uh, volume integral that can be converted into a space integral. The space is the cover of the volume in question. If it is the entire space, it is the boundary of the space at the infinity. And the vanishing of this surface term is guaranteed by the presence of this integral. These are L2 functions. Well, this is a mathematical terminology saying that these Integr these functions are square integrable. You can integrate the square of that and get finite results, right? The finite number is just one. It could be anything. We normalize it. That it, it exists is the most important point. And this L2 nature of the wave functions guaranteed that this surface term or volume, divergence volume, when integrated over all space, it vanishes. So these are very much tied together. They are not random information. That implies that, and this implies this, and that's a very physical principle. Probability is conserved. That is, once you normalize at a given time, it stays normalized ever, unless there is an external interference. Okay. I'm not going to repeat the derivation of these things. We have done it already at the beginning, and you must know it quite well. And it's one of the most beautiful principles. We are going to use it heavily in the relativistic quantum mechanics context. I think that is essentially all the basic ingredients. If I forget something, we'll, it, it will come and we'll, we are going to mention. This is a lightning summary of the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I keep underlying non-relativistic because this quantum mechanics is constructed for the regime in the regimes in which speeds are low. Well, that's Newton, based on Newtonian, Galilean relativity. And in those uh, speeds, uh, those the speeds involved in that particular framework of mechanics is rather low. But we know that there's also another paradigm which is valid at high speeds, which is invented by Einstein at the turn of the previous century, 1905. And there's a new mechanics which describes the motion dynamics of very fast moving bodies, special theory of relativity. Well, that is a classical theory. That's a generalization of the Newtonian mechanics to high speeds. At the classical level, at the classical level, we have the Newtonian mechanics and the Einstein mechanics. That's still classical. The, this is the generalization of the, this Newtonian or Galilean version of classical mechanics to high speeds, but no, con no quantization. So this is macroscopic scales, but high speeds. There is quantum level. very short distances. So this is high speeds. And obviously this is the low speeds. At the quantum level, we have a generalization of the Newton's theory to very short distances or 
atomic distances. Well, it's strange or funny that when this quantum mechanics was completed, formulated, finally, at the 1926, Einstein mechanics was around since 1905 for some 20 years. So uh, people first wanted to quantize the Newtonian mechanics. They could have started with the Einsteinian mechanics. Some people did. Schrodinger himself. The first formulation, the, the first discovery he has ever done was the relativ relativization, relativistic version of quantum mechanics. Then he came up with the Schrodinger theory. But his first attempt was wrong. So it is only natural that as this theory was around, the Einstein's version of relativity, it was only natural that if you are trying to construct a quantum mechanics, you should have started with this one. Forget the Newtonian version. Newton version is old. But anyway, the synthesis was completed for the Newton's version, its non-relativistic regime in 1926. And eventually, it is relativized immediately, several months after, really, relativistic quantum mechanics by Dirac. Again, 1926-27. So what we are doing is, you can call it relativization of the quantum theory, but quantum theory, non-relativist quantum theory, or quantization of the relativistic mechanics, whichever way you look at it. So there are two beautiful theories. A classical theory at high speeds, a quantum theory at short distances, we know that, that short distances involve high speeds as well, atomic scale. The average electron in an atom is alpha times the C. C is 300,000 kilometers per second, so 1% is of it is very high again. So it's only natural that we should merge or marry these two beautiful theories, relativity and quantum mechanics, and that's what we are going to do. Fine. Here are the, non the basic ingredients or axioms of the non-relativistic quantum theory. So when we move to, to relativistic regimes, we expect that these basic principles hold true, particularly this probabilistic interpretation. We have to have a wave function in the coordinate language whose, whose density mod square should describe still the probability density and the sum over all options should add up to one. So this is a very crucial point that we have to retain. Okay, and it follows that it should be conservation of probability, which is to be guaranteed by the presence of a continuity equation, etc. That is, the new equation that we will obtain, which is a generalization of this, should again produce or yield a continuity equation of that sort. Obviously, these things are so much tied together. So once that is understood, we have to list a, a few basic principles of the special theory of relativity so that we can try to merge with those basic ingredients. Well, first of all, so the, the special theory of relativity have two, it's built on two basic principles. It is the principle of relativity. Well, as far as this is concerned, this principle of relativity is concerned, it is the same as the one formulated by Newton some 300 years ago. Or perhaps you better give the credit more to Galileo. These two guys are inter, you know, inter, so, so equivalent to each other as far as their contributions are concerned. I think, to be fair, let's call it Galilean relativity. It says the physical laws are the same in all inertial frames. That's a very beautiful principle. Laws of physics are same in all inertial frames. Inertial frames. I want you to think about these concepts. This inertial frame concept is a rather uh, significant, but when you come to think of it, a very restrictive concept. 
Inertial frames are those reference frames which move with constant velocity with respect to some frames at rest. You have to think of only frames moving with constant velocity. When you think of it, even you are driving a car, you just press the gas pedal and speeds up and eventually press the brakes and it slows down. And there are so much acceleration involved in our, all our lives. Even this planet that we are sitting on is moving around the sun with uh, uh, accelerated motion. So therefore, when you come to think of it, that you have restrict yourself to these inertial frames is really a big restriction. But anyway, it's a beautiful principle. It says that if the frames are uh, inertial, then you cannot distinguish this from a rest frame. The laws of physics are the same. In that frame or in that frame, if they are moving with respect to each other with constant velocity. Not the speed. Speed is the magnitude of the velocity. It must be the constantness, constancy of the velocity vector. So when you are doing a accelerated motion like circular motion with constant speed, that's not an inertial frame. Although the speed is constant, the velocity is not because it is bending. So you should never forget this. So it, my actual purpose here is not to teach you principle of the theory of relativity. So this is good enough. I, I could now proceed with the new one, which was new in the Einstein's version. This was common with Einstein and Galileo, and this is the new one. The speed of light is constant, is the same, that is, independent of the motion. of the motion of the observer or source or the observer. Source or observer. Well, this is new. Well, you may say perhaps this was there as well in Galileo. Yes, it was constant but infinite. Now it was measured to have a finite value. It has, perhaps I should underline, it's finite and constant. Although it's a trivial statement, finite and constant. Galileo's version was constant too, but it was infinite. So signals, if it was light, light, once you shine it, it reaches uh, to the other point immediately, simultaneously. It's called action at a distance. But at the time of, at the, at the turn of this previous century, 1900s, there was so much action on the light. Light was the, really the magic of the universe. It has so many interesting properties from wave to corpuscle, partic particle nature, etc. It was fluctuating back and forth from time of Newton to Huygens and Huygens to Young and Young to Planck and Einstein. It was at Einstein. Newton thought it was of corpuscular nature, particle nature. It was sort of a shower of stream of bullets, little bullets, very, very tiny bullets. And Huygens promoted the wave version and Young experimentally demonstrated that it goes through diffraction or interference experiments, so it should really be a wave like the waves of water. At the turn of the century with the Planck and Einstein, it was clear that it had also particle nature, quantum lump-like corpuscular nature. So it was sort of a chaotic situation. The thing probably depicted a behavior like wave through interference and diffraction. It depicted a behavior like corpuscles or particles at what? The famous photoelectric effect, right? Anyway, so that there was this strange behavior of light. Also, there was the measurements of the speed, the famous one is Michelson and Mer Morley before the turn of the previous century. And these gentlemen have measured, well actually the speed was measured a few, some time ago, FISO, even 100 years ago, to close to today's value of 300,000 kilometers per second. And the, the beauty or the great uh, revolution of the Michelson-Morley was that it was a constant value, independent of the direction of the motion, that famous gadget, some of you perhaps have done it in the laboratory, 
So independent of the source or the motion, it had the constant value 300,000 kilometers per second. This is the new one. But it wasn't radically new. It was a constant there at infinite. It's a constant now finite. So once you have these two principles, you can, obviously you could construct a new paradigm. It's radically different from Newton Galileo version. What was the basic, the immediate change, immediate move away from the Galilean version? The very nature of time. In the Galileo Newton version, time was absolute. There was three space. Mr. Descartes, I guess, was responsible of those frames. There were three space dimensions, and there was a constant flow of time. It was like a river moving, independent of the, what's happening in the space dimensions. So it is the concept of absolute time. Now, once you moved in to this, uh, combine these two principles to construct a new version of physics, obviously time couldn't have totally desolated, isolated from the concepts of three space. It's tied to the space. So what we have obtained is that time I will do it the funny language, absolute time plus three space dimensions. This was the real structure of the geometry of space. I don't call it space time because there was an absolute time regulated by the turn of the Earth around the sun, perhaps. With the constant, it flowed with constant speed because that was regulatory motion. Earth was rotating about the sun, but there was three space. Then it became obvious with the physical insight of Einstein and with the mathematical contribution of his colleagues and friends like po Minkowski and simultaneously by Poincaré that the space, it wasn't really this absolute time plus three space. It was four-dimensional space-time. Now, space-time. That is, time is not absolute anymore. Anymore. In the same status. It is in the same status. With the space coordinates. That's the revolution. So we have to put them together. If you would like to describe the dynamics of a object, we have to label it with the coordinates, four-dimensional coordinates. Now it, we have to distinguish the upper and lower stage. Now we start with the contravariant, the upper one. And it has a zeroth component which is defined as the C times the T. And the Cartesian coordinates takes place as the first, second, and third coordinates of this four-dimensional coordinate system. Well, some times ago, some 40, 50 years ago, there was another language, another notation, which was using imaginary time. So it was the x1, x2, x3, and x4, without distinguishing upper or lower case letters. And they were all the Cartesian. And so in order to use that Cartesian metric, people introduced x4, defining the i, c, t. But that metric is old and it's the neglect, it's now, it is uh, dropped out and it's some first versions of some books contain that language. So when you read them, you'll see the difficulty associated with that old notation. Now this notation is much better. And also we can define a covariant one with the help of a metric tensor, second rank symmetric tensor, and it becomes x0 is still the same, upper or lower, 
and the space part of the coordinate is the minus of the Cartesian coordinate. And so you can immediately deduce the form of the G mu nu, which is 1, minus 1, minus 1, and minus 1. I should warn you that in uh, general relativity, they use the opposite matrix with the minus sign of this, minus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. Anyway, these are conventions. This is the usual convention we are going to use in our uh, class, and most relativistic quantum mechanics literature use this particular version. Obviously, the upper, this other tensor with both indices are raised up. They also, it's also the same. That is, so you can say that the product of these two, which you can define as the g squared, No, I will introduce that later. It's a bit early for that. So this is the four, four vector which describes space and time together. And these are this, the indices, the meaning of the indices and relationship between space and time. Perhaps at this level, as I'm dealing with the space and time, I should introduce the gradient operator in the three-dimensional Cartesian space, when you have the x, you define this to be as, these are the Cartesian coordinates, dx, dy, dz, correct? Cartesian. I, in this particular class, I label the Cartesian coordinates with an arrow on the top. And if you have to use indices, you can either use x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, or x, y, z. It's, there is no danger of getting confused about that when you are using x, y, z. Now, what we have to define next is if you have this x mu, what is the associated d? Let me use this notation, d, d mu, which we define to be d dx mu, d sub. Now, obviously, the arrow of notation doesn't help. We have to use these indices. And this one is then d dx 0, d dx 1, d dx 2, d dx 3. As the x super 1, super 2, super 3, that is here, it means x super i are identified, associated with the Cartesian ones. And x lower i are identified with the minus the Cartesian one. Therefore, this one is the Cartesian del. And if you, if you would like to write the x0 as ct, so it's 1 over cd by dt. The, anyway, let's keep it as it is. So this is d by dx0, the Cartesian coordinate. This one is super. When you use that language, it is the lower mu. So similarly, if we pursue now the d dx sub mu, which by def default it's a super mu, will be d dx zero. Notice that because of the presence of one in the g zero zero position, independent of whether it's up or down, the, the first derivative is the same and the minus. This invites you to be a bit careful about the notation with the, by, when you compare well, let me, if, you, if I overemphasize that this is the law. If you look at this versus that, the contravariant vector, that is x mu up, contains the Cartesian x in the space part. But this gradient mu up 
contravariant as if as the minus d Cartesian gradient. So it is a subtlety you have to be careful about that. So it, it, I think that's the only place which you, you need to be careful because when I will reanalyze the Schrodinger theory in this context, I will use that information. Before turning my attention to actual quantum mechanics, now let me complement this labeling of dynamical variables by focusing on the momentum operator. Well, you know, in classical physics, the, whether Newtonian or Einstein doesn't matter, the states are described by the specification of position and momenta for each degree of freedom. So position and momenta are really a central it has the character of central dynamical variables. They are at the heart of everything. And besides, Hamiltonian is also a derivative of these uh, basic variables. That's classical. X and P. Well, when we moved into quantum theory, as we have seen already at the non-relativistic version, it is not both, either or, half or half. Either use the X set only, and go to the psi xt, psi of xt language, or use the p and go to the phi of pt language, but not both. Why? For very good reason. Because they are conjugate pairs for each degree of freedom. So you cannot measure them simultaneously. And there is, because of the uncertainty principle, if one of them is known fully, the other is fully unknown, un fully uncertain. One good example is the free particle or plane wave. You, you have seen that when we use, constructed the usual plane waves to be the eigen functions of the momentum operator because P and P squared commutes. We knew that X was fully uncertain. It could be, the object could be anywhere on that plane front which is infinite dimensional. So we have to keep that in mind. If that is the case, then uh, still, although we are going to distinguish them, split them into this group or that group, still I need the notation in the relativistic quantum mechanics. Now, as T was attached to the space, energy is attached to the momentum, and we have the four momentum, P0, E over C, and the P. The, co the conventional three-dimensional momentum we put on the Cartesian, the space part P1, P2, P3 is composed of that three, well-known three-dimensional momentum vector. And the zeroth component is related to the energy. Notice that this is to match the dimensions. It's not the energy directly, it's a E by C, which only carries the dimension of, obviously, momentum. If you were using a, the, the natural unit system in which C is set equal to 1, you wouldn't worry about these things. Energy and momentum have the same dimension, therefore 1 is the zeroth component, like time being the zeroth component of the four-dimensional space-time. This is the four-dimensional momentum vector. Okay. So that sort of completes the picture now. What we have to do next is to denote an important and interesting property of the, these four-dimensional vectors. Let's go back to the three-dimensional vector again. We know that length of the vectors in this three-dimensional Euclidean space are invariant under rotations, rigid rotations, right? About any point. Length are important. So we have to define a length in this four-dimensional space-time. Lengths are so-called the invariant lengths are defined in the following manner. We are going to position later. So here, well, let me put the mu. Then we are going to drop that summation sign. We will say that repeated indices in this new geometry are understood to be summed over. That's a convention, mathematical convention. 
And so they, you have to put one of them up, one of them down. I don't want to get into the real discussion of four-dimensional geometry. Please accept this as a working rule or do a bit of reading in the theory of special relativity if you haven't done so previously. I hope you have done that. So what is the meaning of this? PI and PI. Again here the repeated indices are summed. Either whether it's the four-dimensional indices or three-dimensional indices doesn't matter. When you see them repeated in new convention, I am introducing that they are summed. We don't want to carry over the summation sign all over. So this is P0 squared. Now P sub i is according to our definition of contravariant and covariant. Perhaps I can put it here. P mu is G mu nu. P nu. Again, the summation is understood. E over C minus the P, if you want. So that this is the minus the PI. Super indices are the one which correspond to the Cartesian ones. So it is P squared, which is E squared over C squared minus the P squared. Now I say this is m squared c squared. Why? We said these are the invariant lengths, invariant under the, the, the four-dimensional rotations now, in principle, a generalization of the three-dimensional rotations. So if this is invariant under Lorentz, going from one frame to another, which are the, that's really the transformation we are talking about, you can think of determining this in the rest frame. If you think of determining this in the rest frame, PR mu, PR mu, what is these expressions in the rest frame? E rest divided by C, zero, correct? Zero is the momentum. If you look at the a particle from its rest frame, that is, it's sitting there, it's not moving. What is the ER? ER then is the MC squared, so MC squared divided by C is MC, so therefore you get that result. So it's an important point to keep in our mind. If, as, as you work on this special theory of relativity, this is a, one of the basic ingredients you always get. Okay. Well, perhaps uh, this uh, relationship we can carry over and now focus our attention on. So what does it tell us? It, tell us, it gives us a relationship between the energy and momentum, and these type of relations are known as dispersion, real energy-momentum dispersion relations. So if you solve it, you get E squared is equal to C squared P squared plus M squared C to the 4. I'm still at the classical level. You see, I'm, I found a relationship between the energy and momentum thanks to the principle of relativity that energy has been identified as the zeroth component of the form momentum. Therefore, you for a free particle, this is the relationship between the energy and the momentum, which is to be compared against the classical one, which is p squared over 2m, that's the Newtonian Galilean version of the free particle energy, as there is no potential. So therefore, this is really the energy momentum dispersion relation. So you see the radical difference between these two equations. That's Einstein's version, and this is Newton's version. Not only that time has radically changed from absolute to a dynamical nature to in the same status as the space, the energy and momentum, different, the relations have also radically changed. For example, you cannot think of massless objects in the Newtonian case. You, all the bodies carry a mass. Uh, an object means something carrying a mass, but here you can think of a massless object, right? If you set m equals zero, you see that you, your energy is c times the p. 
Does there exist such entities? Yes, light itself is an entity like that. It is massless all the time and it moves with, this, with that particular speed all the time, 300,000 kilometers per second. So its momentum, energy momentum relationship is E equals CP and there is no room to identify the light in the Newtonian version. If this is really the radical, one of the basic differences between the Newtonian Galileon, sorry, I keep saying Newtonian, but here mechanics is Newton's, principle of relativity is Galileo's. You know, these two guys are both the great minds of the classical era. Huh? Therefore, I have to now see whether I can summarize the quantum mechanics, the conventional non relative to quantum mechanics, just focusing on these energy relationships. Instead of saying energy relationships, I'll focus on that uh, Newtonian version because that's non-relativistic. And then I will check and see whether I can start from that and go to its corresponding relationship and uh, get a quantum mechanical relation very cheaply for a few pennies only, really. But it's, life is not that simple, obviously. So let's take the E equals p squared over 2m. Let's go to the quantum mechanics. This is classical energy momentum dispersion relation. Well, we call the E operator as H. Well, usually, although Hamiltonian is known classical mechanics in different versions like Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, but it's customary to you call it the H when it's the Hamiltonian operator and the P operator squared divided by 2m. This is an operator statement now. How do I make use of this operator statement to construct a relativistic quantum mechanical equation? Well, you can think of the following. Let's write it as h minus p operator squared divided by 2m is equal to 0 as an operator statement. And if it is true as an operator statement, you can think of acting by that on an arbitrary function of space and time and still should be valid if it is an arbitrary function. If it is true as an operator statement, it must be true as an uh, expression of that sort. Now, we have to remember the basic axioms of the quantum theory that we have been listing at the beginning. We have seen that here H has the following form. Well, I call not equal because they're not always equal, depending on the representation. They are associated with these operators. P, actual explicit expressions are these. What is this? H bar over I, the gradient operator. In what basis? The space of functions of x. If it was space of functions of p, using the p, base, p basis, of course, that would be different. Particularly, the second one would be a multiplication operator only. So if we substitute that up, what we get? What we get is i h bar d by dt plus h bar squared over 2m del squared psi of x and t is equal to zero. Indeed, that's the Schrodinger equation. Well, you say, oh, of course, no big surprise. You have used the basic axioms that you have identified. Big. Yes, that's true. But I have just uh, indicated in, in this example a quick derivation of the Schrodinger equation. I wasn't really deducing the operator correspondences. We have accumulated that information in due time till 1926. Why that is interesting as an exercise? Because you may hope to repeat the same kind of reasoning for the energy and momentum in the quantum version of that expression. If it's a classical expression, to make it quantum, you replace the E with the E operator, P with the P operator, and convert it into the following version. Uh, 
h squared minus c squared p squared minus m squared c to the 4 is equal to 0. These are h is already, well, if you want, you put additional op operator. Well, that's the quantum version. Or this is the class, classical C number version. That's the operator version of the same equation. You replace everything with the corresponding operators. And then you write the explicit operators in it. What are they? I h bar. Oh, by the way, and you say if this is valid as an operator statement, it should be valid if you act by that on an arbitrary function of space and time, it should still be valid, it should vanish. So it is i h bar d by dt squared minus c squared h bar over i d i squared minus m squared c to the 4 psi is equal to 0. This is what we get by the naive generalization of the previous argument. Let's work on this. For example, first let's divide it by C and let's, well, what I do, will do is the following. Divide this by, multiply this with our H squared, C squared. Multiply. So what you get? H bar squared is killed by that and you have additional C squared and I squared gives you a minus sign. 1 over C squared D squared DT squared. I squared is converting this into minus C squared is cancelled. H bar squared is cancelled. So you have a D squared. minus m squared c squared c squared part goes away h bar squared psi is equal to zero <coughs> what is this let me write this first of all in the following form minus 1 over c squared d squared dt squared minus del squared minus m c divided by h bar squared. If you take the minus out, that becomes plus. What is this? Well, let's work it out with the operators that we worked over there, we have formulated. Consider now d mu d mu, which is d dx mu d dx mu. Indices are repeated, so there is a summation, which is d 1 over c squared. 1 over c squared, d squared, dt squared, because we know that these parts are the same. And second, one, one of them is plus the Cartesian coordinate, the other is the minus the Cartesian coordinate. So you see, that operator which appeared in there is nothing but the four-dimensional generalization of the D'Alembertian. So it is the B will denote this. This is the notation as d by dx i squared is represented by del squared. So this is the Dalam version. So the new equation becomes del mc h bar squared psi is equal to zero. So it's a, pl it's a place worth of a joke. Eureka, we found it so easy, finished. Right? Is this really the correct relative to quantum mechanical equation? Some of you know very well that it's not, and so we are going to go through that. Although it was so beautifully simple. It takes anybody five minutes essentially, once you know the Schrodinger theory, to get this equation. 
Well, this equation actually has a meaning. The Klein-Gordon equation actually is Schrodinger, which developed this first. As he has seen that this is wrong quantum mechanically, he, draw, he threw it away. So it goes with the name of Klein and Gordon, two, two graduate students. Great Schrodinger has really has discovered that before, that several months before. Well, this is, as I said, known as Klein-Gordon equation. It has a meaning in the context of classical field theory and quantum field theory, but not quantum mechanics, in which psi is the wave function whose mod square gives you the probability density, and the sum of that probability density squared is 1, etc., etc. If you check, you'll see the pathology that that normalization property is not satisfied. Some of you who is taking quantum field theory for the first part, you have already seen that pathology associated with the norm. Not only that, there are other pathologies I will point out after the break, and there's also a pathology of that sort. It comes up in a different context later in the quantum field theory. Aha, uh -huh, that's the Higgs field. You may say, if it is associated with that beautiful, the most important discovery of the humankind, essentially, how could it be wrong? It's wrong in this context. It's correct in the other context in the field theory. So it's a good point to stop, and we will continue after the break.